Psalm chapter 8. Now, in the book of Psalms, you're going to notice there's a lot of, of Psalms that are quoted in, in other portions of the Bible, especially in the New Testament. There's a lot of quotations. We're going to look at some of those tonight. And as every other one, I mean, Psalm 8 is only nine verses long. Yet again, it is packed full of tons of doctrine. There's a lot we're going to learn tonight. So hopefully you can listen up, pay attention, try not to get distracted with the, with the children or anything else going on around you. And let's, let's dig into God's word. So look at verse number one there. The Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Now, we're going to stop and pause right here, just on verse number one. And you'll notice here, not only in verse number one, the, the, the psalm or the song starts out saying, how excellent is thy name. And then look at the last verse in Psalm 8. The Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So the psalm begins and ends with the same exact statement. And he's saying, O Lord... Because God's name is the Lord. And when you see Lord in all caps there, that Lord in all caps means Jehovah. It's the name of God. And we're going to get into the name of God a little bit tonight. He says, O Lord, in all caps, Jehovah, which means Lord. And he says, O Lord, our Lord. And what's the Lord? The Lord is a boss. The Lord is the master. The Lord is in charge, right? So, He's, he's, he's speaking to God and he's calling out to God and basically saying, Oh God, or Oh Jehovah, or Oh Lord, our Lord, and giving God that, that position and that title that he so much deserves and that he already has. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, and just praising and exalting the name of God. Now, turn if you would, keep your finger here in Psalm 8, and turn if you would to Psalm 83. And if you've gone out soul winning quite a bit and you've run into someone that, that says, oh, turn, turn to Psalm 83. I want to show you something here. Turn to Psalm 83. Usually they turn, want to turn here before you even get very far at all trying to give someone the gospel. Someone tells you turn to Psalm 83 when you're out soul winning, you could almost guarantee that they're a Jehovah's Witness or Jehovah's false witness, as I like to call them, because they don't have the gospel of salvation. They've got a, ga a gospel that damns people to hell. It's not good news at all. It's bad news because their, their bad news is that you have to keep works and maintain works in order to be saved. And um, that's obviously not the gospel of God. The gospel of God is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's faith. It's not of works. Uh, look at verse number 18 there in Psalm 83. It's the last verse. And this is always what they like to turn to and talk to about, oh, the name of the Lord. Now, we already saw in Psalm 8, he says, how excellent is thy name. God's name is excellent. Why? Because God is excellent. What does that word excellent even mean? It means, you know, if you think of the word just excel, you're, it's excelling. God's name excels, exceeds all other names. It is excellent. It is way beyond and way above all other names, the name of the Lord. And uh, we're going to get to that too in just a minute about the, the name of Jesus Christ. But here in Psalm 83, verse 18, the Bible says that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. So what the Jehovah's Witnesses like to do is say, oh, yeah, see? Now, now keep your finger in Psalm 83, and I want you to turn to Psalm 148. Okay, we're going to compare another scripture here, another passage. Psalm 148 is pretty much just about at the end, the end of the book of Psalms. So right before Proverbs, you'll find Psalm 148. There's only 150 Psalms, so it'll be on the last page of the book of Psalms. And what the Jehovah's Witnesses want to focus on is, oh, how, do you, how can you even talk about God? You don't even know God's name. Because they just want to tout Jehovah, Jehovah, as if God only has one name, which is ridiculous. Because there's so many places in Scripture that talks about God's name, and he has multiple names. The Bible talks about, even when he was talking to, to Moses, and he revealed himself as Jehovah, he says, he, he used to be known as God Almighty. By name of Jehovah was I not known unto them. So there were people for a long portion of history that didn't know the name Jehovah. But they still knew God. It's still the same Lord. They still called him by, uh, you know, by, maybe by a different name than Jehovah, but it was still the same person. It was still the same God. It was still the same entity. 
You want to focus on a name, and they want to focus on a name, and they want to focus on Jehovah. But what, what they do in this verse in Psalm 83, they say, see, God's, they, what they do is they say God's only name is Jehovah. They say God only has one name, and it's Jehovah. And if you don't have the name of God, then you don't have anything. But what does the verse actually say? It says that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah. Does that say that God's only name is Jehovah? No. It says your name alone is Jehovah. That means nobody else has that name. That means that Jehovah, that God is the only one that has the name Jehovah. His name alone is Jehovah. And I don't know about you, but I've never run into anybody, any person on this earth named Jehovah. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but God's the one that owns that name. That is his name that is reserved for God, Jehovah. Now, the reason why I had you turn to Psalm 148 is because this is a very good way to, um, to handle some Jehovah's Witness that wants to have you turn to Psalm 83. Now look, I'll, I'm just going to say this right off the bat too, by the way. When you go out soul winning, and I, I, I ought to teach about this again. I've taught about this before, but when we go out soul winning, when we go out preaching the gospel, we go out to teach people how to be saved. We go out to instruct them. We do not go out soul winning to be instructed on any doctrine, on anything. That is not the purpose. I'm not saying that we know everything about everything when we go out soul winning, but the, the goal and the mission and the objective of going out soul winning is to win souls to Christ. And we don't go out to be told how to be saved or to be told who the name of the Lord is. We go out to teach. Now, in the course of having a conversation with people, when you try to get them saved, yes, we ought to have a conversation where you could do some back and forth and you allow someone else to speak and you could answer some questions. But what you don't want to let happen is let someone else run the conversation and just try to teach you all this stuff and let them control everything on where you're going to go. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. You need to be able to be in charge of the conversation and you still can, can have a conversation and talk to people, but you don't want someone else that's trying to teach you. We actually just ran into that today with some Pentecostal lady who wanted to talk about all these other things. You know, we were trying to just give her a couple of clear scriptures on, you know, being saved and eternal life because she believed you could lose your salvation and backslide and all this other nonsense about losing salvation. And um, we tried to give her a couple of verses, but after a couple of verses, she was all over the place. We just had to turn around and leave. Because she just continually tried to just teach out, oh, teach you this and this and that. What about the Holy Ghost? What about speaking in tongues? And do you have this? And do you have that? And you, you know, we said bye. And and I was just speaking with this with Dave. He was my soul winning partner. And you know, I was talking to him. I said, you know, I am really not a, a rude person at all. I, I I actually, to a fault, will let people speak. I like to be very humble. I like to listen to people. And I don't I don't try. I try not to cut people off when they're talking. And, and I try to engage in a conversation because I actually care about them. And I'm not, I'm not just going to just preach at somebody the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel to them, which consists of engaging in conversation, being able to answer some questions. But what you're not there to do is allow that other person to just teach you. And this is what some Jehovah's Witnesses might try to do to you, is try to drag you all over the Bible through their stupidity and, and trying to, to prove their false doctrines to you, don't let them do that. And if they won't let you lead the conversation and try to show them how to be saved, then you know what you do? You leave. You leave. Because all that person's going to end up doing when they're just trying to teach you, they're not open to, to learning. They're not open to receiving. You know they're not saved. They don't know they're not saved. But if they're just trying to teach you the whole time, then it's not going to do anyone any good. And what's going to end up happening is that you're going to waste time with them. And then the person a few doors down that might listen to you give the gospel, you might not have time to even get to, or they might end up leaving because you wasted all your time letting somebody try to teach you on something you're not going to believe anyways. So don't get caught up in that. But in the course of a conversation, if you haven't gotten to the point to where you're just going to 
going to leave them and you want to be cordial with them and you want to, you know, instead of maybe saying, because usually what I'll do when someone just brings up something, I'll just say, well, let's talk about that in a minute. Right now, I want to talk about this. But sometimes people are real adamant, but I haven't really given them a couple verses yet to just completely move on from them. So a very quick answer to the Jehovah's Witness regarding this verse in Psalm 83, 18 is just turn to Psalm 148, verse 13. Because again, I'll read for you again Psalm 83, 18. I want you to, to compare that and notice the similarities because what they'll do with Psalm 83, 18 is just say, God's only name is Jehovah. And they really want to focus on the name of Jehovah. And they sound like a broken record sometimes. I'm just, you just got to get this name. And it's like, okay, you know, I'll call God Jehovah. I don't care. It's one of his names in the Bible. It's not a problem. But look at Psalm 148, 13. The Bible says, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Now notice the same wording that's used in that verse. Now what's funny is that when you show that Jehovah's Witness, they're not going to say, so is God's name excellent. Is God, is God's only name excellent? Because it says, for his name alone is excellent. Then why do you say that God's only name is Jehovah when, you, when it says, whose name alone is Jehovah? Do you see what I'm saying there? It's the same exact grammar. It's the same exact structure of sentence there. When it says, whose name alone is Jehovah, his name alone is excellent. It doesn't mean his only name is excellent. It doesn't mean his only name is Jehovah. It just means that he's the only one that has the name Jehovah. He's the only one that can have, that whose name is excellent. God. God's name is excellent. And you may have a really great name, but I'm sorry, it's not excellent. I love my name, but my name is not excellent. His name alone, God's name is excellent. So if they want to try to show you, oh, God's only name is Jehovah, you can show them this verse and just be like, look, is his name excellent? Is his name alone? Is his only name excellent? No, it's not. And just, just understand the grammar. And then, then try to move off of that and move back to the gospel. It's a very simple way to do that. But I also love Psalm 148 because, again, it's saying exactly what we're seeing in Psalm 8. The name of the Lord. God's name is excellent. His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Knowing how excellent God's name is, we ought to treat the name of the Lord with reverence, with respect, because it's excellent. And what do people do today? They throw around God's name as if it's meaningless or as if it's trash, or worse than meaningless, as if it's trash. They try to use God's name or names as just being a curse word. You know, one of the Ten Commandments is not to take the name of the Lord in vain. Why? Because God's name is excellent. Because God is the name above all names. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 2. God's name is excellent, which is why we don't take it in vain. What does in vain mean? It means meaningless or for nothing or just as if it's not a big deal. That's why, you know, we never say in my household, we never say, oh my God. Now, you know when it's acceptable to say, oh, my God, when you're speaking to God. You may see in Scripture, especially in the book of Psalms, maybe David or someone going, oh, my God, will you, you know, and like in speaking to God and calling out or crying out to God. If you're calling out to God and you're saying, oh, my God, amen, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not using God's name in vain because you're actually using it appropriately to speak to him. But what happens today is something will happen in someone's life. Uh, uh, you know, so, something will happen that'll be maybe shocking or a surprise. And what does someone say? Oh my God. And dragging down God's name when they have no, they're, they're not speaking to God. There's no reason to bring God into whatever that situation is of whatever they just want to use that phrase. And look, this is important. You might say, oh, what's the big deal? Oh, God knows my heart. It's not that big of a deal. Well, if it wasn't that big of a deal, then why would he make a commandment that says, 
Do not use the name of the Lord in vain. It's because he does care about it. He doesn't say don't use the name of the Lord in vain unless, unless your heart is right. He says don't do it, period. So if you have a problem with that, you need to, to, to watch yourself and make sure that, that you're not taking God's name in vain. Another thing that people do is, you know, they'll say, you know, they'll say Jesus Christ in, in a very blasphemous or a very uh, derogatory way or just as a curse word. You know, someone hits their thumb with a hammer or something and they'll just shout off Jesus Christ. That is not appropriate. That is not right. That is wicked and that's a sin. That is taking the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in vain. At a point when you would norm, where other people might use some, some curse word, you're, to, you're, you're substituting the name of Jesus Christ. That's wicked. That's wrong. And that's not something we ought to do. Now, along the same lines, and you, know, you may disagree with me on this, but I, I, I live my life trying to stay as far away as, from sin as possible. And in so, I don't want to toe the line. I don't want to see how close I could possibly get to taking the, name of the, taking the name of the Lord in vain without actually quite technically doing it. I don't want to just like get off on a technicality with God. So you know what we're, we're, we don't allow in our household as far as with my family and the people that I have authority over? We don't say things like, oh my gosh. You say, well, the name of the, name of the Lord isn't gosh. Yeah, I know. But what you've done is you've changed a D into an SH. And you're getting this close to having even a slip of the tongue and taking the name of the Lord in vain. And you know what? I treat God's commandment so seriously and I reverence God's name so much. Why would I want to see how close I could possibly come to saying or uttering the name of the Lord in vain without quite actually saying it? It's also why I don't say geez, because you know where that came from? Geez isn't a word, but you know what is a word? Jesus. And what happens is people who don't have the, the gall to actually go forward completely with saying Jesus as a curse word or as an exclamation or whatever, they'll just shorten it to G's. We ought to have more respect and more reverence for the name of the Lord and understand that the name of the Lord is excellent. Let's not get anywhere close to saying that if you have to say something because I get it. Look, I understand what it is to be a creature of a habit. I understand that when you do things sometimes you want to say something because that's naturally how we operate. What you need to do then is train yourself to say something. You could say something else in vain. It's the name of the Lord that you don't want to be taking in vain. So, you know, one of the things I'll say is, oh man, you know, something happens, oh man, instead of saying, oh my God, you can say, oh man. Who cares if you use man in vain? Man is vain anyway, so what's a, you know, it's, it's probably closer to the truth than using the name of the Lord in vain. And man isn't anywhere even associated with, you know, the name of God. So you, you're safe with that. And we need to treat God's name as being excellent because it is. Because his name alone is excellent. I do turn to Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 9. Another great place to show someone. Maybe you don't want to show the, the Jehovah's False Witness, Psalm 148, and, and just show them how their grammar is just, how they're mistaken on, on their grammar when they want to continually talk about the name of Jehovah. You say, how about instead of talking about the name Jehovah, why don't we talk about the name which is above every name? Look at verse number 9. Wherefore God also hath exal highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Now is there anything left out of that? Things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth. Is anybody excluded 
from that category. No, that's talking about everybody, everything. Every knee shall bow, whether they're in heaven, whether on earth, whether they're under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. That's a great verse to show to these Jehovah's false witnesses that don't even believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. How could you not have a contradiction where the Bible's saying that God himself is the one saying that, hey, Jesus Christ is a name above all names, above every name, and that every knee is going to bow down. Everybody is going to worship him and it's going to glorify God. How could you not have a contradiction or some type of a schizophrenic type of a God when, when God gave the Ten Commandments and saying, you should have no other gods before me, that you can't bow down or worship or make any graven image unto anyone else. You can't do these things. You should have no other gods before me, that God wants all, our, our direction. God needs our worship. God wants our praise to the exclusion of everybody else. He would be contradicting himself if Jesus Christ was only a man and not God incarnate. It would be a contradiction to think that that wouldn't break God's own commandments. But because Jesus Christ is God incarnate, he is the Word made flesh, there is no contradiction. And you tell him, instead of talking about the name Jehovah, let's talk about the name Jesus. Because that's who they need anyways. They think they have Jesus, but they don't have Jesus. They have an imposter named Jesus that they've created in their own mind. The imposter Jesus that, that wasn't crucified on a cross. No. Yo, you didn't know that? Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross. They believe he was he was put to death on a torture stake, not a cross. No, they need to believe on the Jesus Christ that rose again from the dead bodily. Oh, you didn't know that? They don't believe in the resurrection either? Yeah, try asking them sometime. They don't believe that. Now, they might say it, but you, you have to pin them down sometimes because they don't really want to give you the answer. And some of them might not even know what their, what their false religion or their cult teaches anyways. Is that they don't believe that Jesus Christ, that, that when Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, that he talked about the, the, the temple of his body. Not swapping out some completely different body of just, oh, well, that's just some other body that Jesus used when he rose again from the dead. That when the disciples saw him bodily, it was just some other body. No, his body, the body of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ was put to death, hey, guess what? His tomb was empty. Not because his, his flesh just disintegrated and turned into nothing, but because he rose again from the dead. Because he came back in his flesh and even showed the disciples, he showed doubting Thomas the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet and the pierced side. And told him, be not faithless, but believing. And what did Thomas respond with? My Lord and my God. So I believe. And did Jesus rebuke him and say, no, 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 wait, I'm not God. Did Jesus rebuke him and say, no, 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 I'm not your Lord. No, he says, now that you've seen, you believe. Blessed are they that it, which have not seen and yet believe. So you've seen me and you believe that I'm God. You're right. Lots of great verses. And that's in the book of John. That's, I forget which chapter it is near the end. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can look it up yourself. It's uh, like, I believe it's like the second to last chapter. Or somewhere around there. Where that, uh, where that story takes place. Let's go back to Psalm 8. The name of God is excellent. Let's treat it as such. 
When we talk about God, when we talk about Jesus, let's give him respect. The respect that our Savior deserves. The respect that our great, long-suffering, merciful God deserves. Look at verse number 2. Psalm 8, verse number 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 21. I find this, this phrase interesting, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. Has thou ordained strength is what the Bible says. You know, there's, there's people that use that phrase. There's a lot of phrases in the Bible, it's very interesting, that are, that are used in language commonly today. I think a lot of people don't even realize the origin comes from the Bible. And I think that's why sometimes the meanings of these phrases get a little bit screwed up because people don't even know it's from the Bible, so they start misapplying and, and using these phrases, and the phrases get a little bastardized from what they originally intended to mean and cause a little bit more confusion sometimes when you read things. Now, sim, uh, you know, an example of that, just not, not necessarily bastardized, but you know, the phrase is skin of, skin of my teeth. You know, I just got out of there with the skin of my teeth. That's a phrase that's commonly used today, but I don't know if you know this, it was, that was actually comes from the Bible. It comes from the book of Job. Job said that. Um, this one also, out of the mouths of babes, you know, I think there is even a TV show in like the 70s or 80s or somewhere around there that, that was like called out of the mouths of babes or something like that. Now, the concept that's being taught here is that, uh, and in Matthew 21, we're going to see this, uh, being, this verse being quoted in the New Testament by Jesus Christ. And the reason why you've ordained strength because of the enemies, or as, as Jesus quoted it, uh, look, at, look at Matthew 21, we're going to start reading in verse number 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. So, there's children that are praising Jesus Christ that are calling out, Hosanna to the Son of David! Welcoming in the Christ, the Savior, Jesus Christ, and calling out to Him in the temple. And we'll get to that in a minute too. So these, uh, these chief priests and scribes, they saw that they were, they were displeased and said unto Him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? And now he's going to quote Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Basically, they're going to Jesus and saying, Do you hear what these, these children are saying? You know, basically, they're saying, You need to rebuke them and tell them to stop saying these things. He's saying, Haven't you read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Now, why does he say that? And why does the Bible say that? Well, because children are known for speaking their mind. Young children don't learn deceit in how they deal with people until later on in life. Young children will say whatever they hear. That's why you need to teach children sometimes when it's appropriate to say certain things that may be true or that are true, but not always appropriate given different circumstances. And it's not that you teach your children to lie or even to be deceitful. So, uh, you know, my, my choice of words maybe wasn't the best, but because but, children can be deceitful in the sense that they, they will try to avoid punishment by saying, oh, no, I didn't do that, and they'll lie. But what I mean by, by you know, children have a tendency to just say whatever comes to their mind regardless of circumstance, and will just say whatever they think. And in a way, that's a virtue of children, and that's what he's saying here is that, well, if, if a child is going to say something good or positive about you, they're not saying it for any other ulterior motive. They're saying it out of, out of their heart, which is why you've perfected praise, because you know it's genuine. Hey, this is coming out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. It's genuine. It's real. But what people have done with this out of the bowels of babes, because there's this genuineness, sometimes children say things that, um, 
that aren't complimentary. You know, and, 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 and a lot of times people will laugh. So um, an, an example of this, right, is, is uh, if a child were to, to say something about uh, a person being overweight and maybe call them a, a na- you know, just say that they're, just say that they're really big or whatever, just notice some imperfection or some flaw about somebody and they'll just come right out and talk about it or say it as if it's not a big deal because, you know, to, to a child, it's not that big of a deal, but they just notice it and they'll just say it and, and bring it out. And, um, you know, their intention isn't to hurt somebody's feelings or, or anything like that, but they're just saying what comes over. They're saying what they, they, they call it like they see it, basically, is <laughs> just, just, just allowing whatever to come out. And sometimes, you know, we can look at that and that could be kind of funny. And I think that's where the TV show comes out. So people start using this phrase, well, out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of babes. When, when a child says something that maybe they shouldn't say, but it's just comical because they shouldn't say it and they're saying it out loud anyways. But that's not what Jesus was saying. It's actually kind of the opposite, even though it's, it's um, the same principle. But he was say, what he was saying is out of the mouth of, of, of babes suckling, that was perfected praise. He was talking about good things being applied to him. Nobody was say, no child was saying anything um, inappropriate about Jesus or to Jesus. They were saying only good things. And he's saying out of the mouth of babes and suckling, that was perfected praise. And that's the way it's used in the Bible. And... Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize that. But that's, that's what we see here. Now, there's another point I wanted to make here, though. And it's uh, Jesus has a special love for children. And flip back, if you would, real quick to Matthew chapter 19. I think one of the things that got the chief priests and scribes upset in, in Matthew 21, because earlier in the chapter when Jesus is coming in, you have lots of people cutting off tree branches and putting them down in the way and, and, and laying down the path for Jesus as he rides in on the ass. And, and they're, they're all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, you know. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they're exalting Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. But we don't hear anything about the scribes and Pharisees being upset about that. But then Jesus goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers and he drives out the people who are buying and selling in the temple. And then you have the children. Now it says here the children were crying in the temple. What does that mean? They were making a loud noise. They weren't being very quiet. And what's a temple? The temple is the house of God, right? So you have these, these uh, scribes and chief priests. They're probably upset. Why? Because you've got some kids coming in and they're making a little bit too much noise in the temple. And on top of it, they're saying, you know, Hosanna to the son of David. And they're being a little bit loud. But you know what? Jesus doesn't have a problem with that at all. He doesn't. And you know, this is the concept that I think churches have gotten away from. Hopefully you're in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 19, just two, two, two chapters back, is um, having a family integrated church. That's why, this is, there's, there's many reasons why we do this. But one of the reasons why we do this is we don't think that children should be separated from their families. And I don't think that that's biblical. I think the biblical model has more to do with families bringing their children in, hearing the preaching from the Bible straight from God's Word, not needing to be separated, and allowing the children to come unto Jesus, to hear the Word of the Lord, and to hear it in church, to hear it in the temple, you know, whatever. And we just have to suffer the little children and allow the, sometimes the distractions or the noises that might be made and not, like, just get so upset. Oh, man, that's, you know, Jesus, you got to do something about this. Look at Matthew 19, verse number 13. The Bible says, Then, there were, then were there brought unto him little children, so I went to Jesus, the people brought little children, Jesus, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked him. So his own disciples, look, this is something that people who have a good heart, that want to follow Jesus, can also have a problem with. And the disciples are saying, don't bring these kids into Jesus, you know. But what does Jesus say? But Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not 
to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't, you guys are wrong. Don't forbid the children. Allow them to come unto me. Jesus sees the importance of the children. We should see the importance of the children. Church is important for us. Hearing the, the, the Bible preach, obviously uh, adults are going to understand a lot more. But children understand too. And children need to hear the word of God and need to come to Jesus just as much as anyone else does. Maybe even more. So we should not be forbidding them. We should not be putting them off and, and you go over here. We're all going to hear the word of God. You just go over there and play. No, they need to hear too. But the children need to learn how to be able to pay attention and learn how to hear the word of God as well. And it's great training when we bring them into church. Now, uh, let's go back to Psalm chapter 8. I don't want to spend too much time in that. We got, we, there's actually like almost every verse here has some great teaching and doctrine associated with it. Verse number 3, Psalm 8. The Bible says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And I, I love this, this verse, really speaks my heart, these verses. I'm someone who actually, you know, I, I really enjoy God's creation, especially the stars and kind of looking up into the heavens and just, and just kind of pondering and thinking and looking at all this stuff. And we just, we just recently went, last Friday, we went to the planetarium up here and saw this great presenta presentation. And you kind of see, that they, they, you know, now it's great with their illustrations how you can get um, an understanding of, of how expansive the universe is, and not just the universe, but just the planets within our own solar system and the stars, and just how incredibly gigantic they are, and just the sense of the expanse, I mean, just, just the sheer size of some of these, these heavenly bodies, these planets and these stars that God has created. And when you really sit there and think about it, and you look up into heaven, you know, and just consider that God made these huge, great things out there and there's so many of them and it's just, just innumerable, the stars that are out there and, and just th this, this huge expanse of universe that God has created. What are we? We're these little tiny specks on this little ball floating in the middle of space with all of this other, all these other planets, all these other solar systems, all these other galaxies all over the place. And here we are. One little tiny, tiny, tiny soul in, in one little grain of sand on a whole seashore of sand. Just one tiny little speck, one tiny little piece. And, and thinking on that, and being humble enough to realize, man, what, what, what is man? God, why, why do you even care so much? What, how, why is it that you even give thought to us? Psalm 144 basically has a, a very similar passage here. Verse number three, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. And it would do us well to just kind of maintain this attitude before you allow yourself to get so lifted up and puffed up in yourself and oh, how great I am and I've done all this and that. What is man? You're a blip. You're just one little thing, you know, according, in, in comparison to all of God's creation. I don't say that to make you think that your life is meaningless or that God doesn't love you or really care about you. What I'm saying that is, is because what, what's, what's awesome and amazing about that is that God does care about us. And he's saying, well, what is man? Like, how, why do you even care about us? Because you do care about us so much. We're just these little things, these ins insignificant things. Why do you care so much about us, God? But he does. And it's a question. It's not, it's not saying that God doesn't care about us. It's saying he does. And just marveling in, in the fact that God does and, and appreciating that with humility. 
Continuing on here in, in Psalm 8, verse number 5, the Bible says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now, keeping an eye on my time, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 1. I want to I just touch on this briefly. We have here the angels being mentioned. And there's, um, there's a doctrine out there which became popular online. I don't know if it's still popular right now. I think it is. The last time I touched on this, you know, there's always people commenting on it. Um, people get really worked up about this. I think it's actually kind of comical how worked up people get about this stupid doctrine that's out there that um, some people buy into this whole serpent seed thing and these shapeshifters or whatever. That's pretty extreme. But other people buy into it, you know, they, they call it Nephilim because they just want to try to use the Hebrew word for giants as if there's something mystical about it and they want to throw in just this, this element of unknown. Oh, what are the Nephilim? Well, the Nephilim, these are these hybrids of angels and humans and that's what happened when, you know, these, these women on earth, you know, had, had these relations with angels and then all of a sudden you have this hybrid, these giants that were created and all this other nonsense, nonsense, and come up with this bizarre doctrine which holds no water whatsoever. I want to go into just a little bit about what the Bible actually says and the characteristics that we can receive about angels. Now, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't give us just, just, Tons and tons and tons of information about this, but it gives us some, all we need to know, and it's pretty clear. Now, I want to start off saying that in verse number five, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. We're going to see here in Psalm 8, there's a, there's a reference to Jesus Christ, but also in the context, it's also just referring to the creation of man. There's kind of a dual application of Psalm 8, uh, 5 and 6. Going a little bit further. So, um, if you're in Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to see talking about Jesus. Even though, you know, we were made or Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, lower doesn't mean worse. That's not, it's not a, it's not a value thing at all. But lower in, um, in the sense that, you know, angels have more power, have different abilities, and lower in, uh, in status. Maybe you could say, but it's actually better. Ver Hebrews verse one, or chapter 1, verse 4 says, being made so much better than the angels. So Psalm 8, 5 says, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Yeah, lower maybe in status, but he is being made so much better. So the value is better. It's better than being an angel. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And again, there's talking about Jesus' name being excellent. You've obtained a more excellent name than they. By inheritance. And who receives an inheritance? A son. A son receives an inheritance. Not someone who's not a son. And the reason why I'm making a point of this is because in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were, you know, fair to look upon. And, uh, you know, they had children together. And they, and they say, see, see, sons of God. That's talking about angels. No, it's not. No, it's not. And, and we can see this in so many places, especially in the book of Hebrews. Referring to Jesus Christ being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, if the angels were sons of God, they would have an inheritance because they were sons. But the distinction being drawn here is that Jesus Christ has the inheritance because he is the son. Verse number five, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The answer, zero. So when has God ever said to an angel, thou art my son? You're my son. He's never said it. Why? Because they're not. They're his creation. It doesn't make them his son. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When did he ever say that the angels have this relationship of God as their father and they are his son? 
hasn't happened. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Why? Because he had a more excellent name. So even though the angels are greater, maybe in stature or something like that, they still had to worship Jesus Christ. They were worshiping a man. And of the angels, he saith, uh, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. And that's important to know, too, because what we, what we learn from that is angels are spirits. He made his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Jump down to verse number 13 in Hebrews 1. The Bible says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits? Again, angels are spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now you tell me this. How is a spirit going to have physical relations with a human being. It's not going to happen. And when do we ever see angels? Angels are the good spirits of God that obey God and do His will because the angels that follow Satan are referred to in the Bible as devils. They're not angels, they're the, they're the opposite. They're devils. We may see devils inhabiting or possessing a human body, but we do not see angels possessing a human. They don't do that. The devils do that. The angels do not. So you can't tell me that, well, the angels are sons of God and the angels came down and the angels inhabit another word and you're going to say an angel. You know why they're not going to say that? Because you're never going to find a devil being a son of God. Because if you take it to its logical conclusion, then you're going to say that Satan is a son of God and Jesus is a son of God. So now you believe in Mormonism because now you're going to say, well, if Satan's the son of God, Jesus is the son of God, then Satan and Jesus are brothers. And that's what the Mormons believe. Be careful of your stupid doctrines because you want to believe in all this, you know, all the giants and all this hidden stuff. And, uh, you know, people are just trying to hide this and we need to expose this. And there was really these giants that were 50 feet tall and all this other nonsense. Nonsense. Now, the Bible does say there were giants in the land, but it gives us an idea of how large they actually were. 8 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Nothing out of the realm of just, you know, a skyscraper of a giant. And then to try to say that, oh, it was an angel. An angel that, that, that had relations with a, with a human woman. An angel that's a spirit and being. An angel that is not a devil... And even if it were possible, you know, as, as the devils inhabit a person, it's still physical seed that happens during that event of, of a man lying with a woman. It's still a physical event. The only time it's ever been anything other than that is, is when Jesus Christ was born. And Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you what, Genesis 6 talks about... about relationships happening between people. Mary did not have that type of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. She did not have a physical relationship when Jesus Christ was conceived in her womb. That's not how it happened. It's a supernatural event. And the Holy Ghost was able to, to conceive inside of Mary's womb without the physical thing. That's why she was still a virgin. And um, it was a miraculous event. And to say that these other beings were created the same way actually detracts from the Lord Jesus Christ. It detracts from the miraculous birth. And you're, you're trying to explain something that physically is impossible. And we have more evidence to show that this is physically impossible. One, they're not all, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. 
their job as an angel is to minister unto them that are heirs of salvation, unto humans. Their job is being a minister. They're working for us, believers. They're not going and, and deceiving women or getting involved in, in some weird relationship as a spirit. It's not happening. They don't, as spirits also, they don't have flesh and bone. They can't do the physical. Luke 24, 39, when Jesus Christ appeared unto his disciples, says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. He's saying, touch me. You can feel me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Angels don't have flesh and bones as you see that he has. He says, that's what a spirit are. Angels are ministering spirits. He says, the spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. I have flesh and bones. Angels do not marry. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 22, if you want to see this. Matthew 20, or you could say in Hebrews, or go to Hebrews chapter 2. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And the people that believe in these weird Nephilim things that, that are hybrids of humans, they err not knowing the scriptures. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So what does that say? The angels of God in heaven, they don't marry. They're not given in marriage. Why? They don't have relations. You know, one of the things that the Bible says, to avoid fornication, let every man take a wife. That's one of the reasons why you get married. Well, why do the angels not marry or give in marriage? Because they're not fornicating. Because they don't have to avoid fornication because they don't do that because they don't have physical bodies because they're spirits. They don't have that relation. They're not taking wives of the children of men. It's not an angel doing that. Sons of God are believers. They've always been believers. I preach an entire sermon teaching that, is showing that from Scripture that a son of God is a believer. Whether in the book of Genesis or the book of Revelation, the son of God is a believer. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to tie this in now a little bit more with, um, with Psalm 8 when we saw, you know, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with the glory and honor. We're going to see this reference here. Verse number 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Sound familiar? Is what we just read in Psalm 8 being quoted again in the New Testament. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So now he's going to explain and expound even further on this psalm and how it relates to Jesus Christ. Because there's a prophecy to be explained here and there's light being shed on this Old Testament scripture to help us understand even more about Jesus Christ and saying, well, right now we see not all things are put under him. Jesus Christ doesn't, isn't ruling and reigning. Not everything has been put under him in suggestion. He's not in charge Quite yet. Verse number nine. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So who are called brethren with Jesus Christ? Amazingly, those that are sanctified. Believers. Angels aren't sanctified through Jesus Christ. They, they, don't, they don't have a plan of salvation like we do. You have angels and devils. And the devils are going to be cast in the lake of fire with Satan. Satan. They're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
And angels don't. Angels won't. They don't, they don't. they aren't treated the same exact way that human beings are. And the angels aren't considered Jesus' brethren. But we are. Why? Because we receive Christ. Because through Christ, we, we are born of the seed of God. We're born again. Our spirit is born again. And that's how we could become and be called his brother. His brother. Even if it is just an adopted brother, we can be called his brother. And Hebrews chapter 2 explains that. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That's another psalm being quoted there. Turn if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to see a little bit more reference now to everything being put under Christ's feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 23, the Bible says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming, then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So this is, this is referring to the coming kingdom and the coming reign of Jesus Christ. In describing the, the rapture first, or the resurrection, you have the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ is the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. So when Jesus Christ comes back, there's another resurrection. That's what we will be taking part in, is that resurrection of Christ when he comes back. And then come at the end, and the end being referred to here is after the millennial reign of Christ, when he, talking about Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So, the Father gives the Son authority, all authority, all power. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom here on earth and rules and reigns for a thousand years. After that, after that reign, then Jesus Christ delivers up the kingdom back to the Father, putting God the Father back in authority when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So he's going to reign and reign and reign. It says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So while he's reigning, there's still death in the world. There's still his death. He hasn't, he hasn't put down his feet until uh, he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. I don't have time to get into all that tonight. That's a great verse, um, just even describing the Trinity and the triune nature of God, that, that there are three persons in one, God is one. But we see here a delegation of power. We see Jesus Christ being in charge and then the Father being in charge and they're, and they're happening at two different times. Going back to Psalm 8, let's finish up this chapter. Psalm 8, verse number 6, the Bible says, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, um, in the context here, you know, we, we, just, we just saw some verses in Hebrews chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 referring to Christ and referring to, to him having dominion over everything and being in charge and ruling the kingdom. And there's obviously that application being made and it's very, very true and that light's being shed. But there's also just in the context of Psalm 8, you know, he refers to, you know, what is man? And then he continues on in Psalm 8 to talk about Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. So this is also referring to just man in general, God's creation. Having dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet. Um, verse number seven, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the fields. So he's, he's listing off the things being put under the feet of man. Sheep, 
oxen, beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Let's make a brief point on this. God made man to have dominion over the earth. God gave man the authority over the rest of God's creation. He says, the sheep, the oxen, the birds, the fish, you've got authority. You have dominion. And you think of the word dominion, that's like, you know, a king has a domain. He has a dominion. He has his area where he rules and reigns supreme. And he, God has given unto man who is made in the image of God the ability to have dominion over God's own creation. He says, you're in charge. And why am I making such a point of that? Why? Because today we have people who have this inordinate affection, this ungodly love for animals that goes above and beyond what's normal or what's right and they say things like, oh, well, dogs are people too, or cats are people. No, they're not. They're not people too. They're animals. And you know what? God has given us dominion over animals. That's why it's perfectly acceptable to use an animal to be a work horse. Or be a work horse. You have a horse that can do work for you. You can have oxen that are going to plow for you in the field and to use them as your servant or as your slave to do your bidding because you have dominion over them. You can have an animal as a pet. You can have animals. You can eat the animals. You can do these things because we have dominion over them. Now, we ought not to just be super abusive with what God has given us dominion over. We ought to have dominion rule and reign righteously. But I'll tell you what, you can't go putting the life of an animal on par with the life of a human being, which is what people are trying to do these days, these weirdos that just, you know, like uh, when a police dog dies, they want to say, oh, well, you killed a cop. And you're going to get the same punishment as if you killed a person, if you kill a dog, if you kill a piece of property. That's wicked. That is wicked as hell. We see in the very beginning of everything, God giving dominion unto man, unto mankind. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. This is why God gave man dominion, because man is special. He, made, he made, gave man a spirit. He gave man a conscience. He gave man understanding, and he made man in the image of himself. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Why is it our? Because God is, is a trinity. Because you have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Let us make man in our image. And no, again, he's not referring, he's not talking, God's not talking to him and the angels. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, he says, make man in our image, and then it makes him in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, I'll, I'll submit this as well. You know, God has given mankind, in general, given men dominion over his creation. That authority comes from God. Now, we have governments today that try to usurp the authority that God has given everybody. And we have governments that think that they can tell you, oh, you can hunt and you can fish and you can't do this and you need to pay us money in order to do this. You know what? God's given me dominion over this. I don't need your license. I don't need your permission to go out and hunt or fish or do whatever I want to do with these animals that God has given us. You didn't give me those animals, government or whatever man you are. God gave them to us. And he gave them to us all. And if I want to go and have dominion over it, you know what? I'm going to do it. Now, and, and if I were to do that, 
I would have the authority from God and I would morally be right. Now, do I just go and break the laws of our land right now because God's given me authority? No, I don't. Because, especially in that regard, you know, would I, if my family was, was requiring to be fed and that was, that was the only way I was able to do it, was to have to go out and, and provide in that way? You better believe I would because there's nothing wrong with it. But uh, in, in an oppressive uh, situation, you know, just because I have the authority to do it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to live peaceably with, with every man as much as is in me as possible. So I'm going to try to do that, try to obey. Even, even where government oversteps their boundaries, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to live peaceably and not, and not do that. But um, I'm showing you from the Bible where God gives the authority and just be able to teach you right from wrong. It's not right for, for someone else to, to take away your dominion when God's given you dominion. And um, unfortunately, you have a lot of people who, who don't understand that and try to abuse things. And then um, man's solution to that is to just make things illegal and require permission and everything else. That's a whole other study and a whole other sermon. I don't want to get into that tonight. But let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much. God, uh, you truly are amazing. Your name alone is excellent, dear Lord. I pray that you will please help us all to remember that and to magnify your name and magnify Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will please help us to, to do a good job at that and to mind our mouth and help us to, to not be disobedient and break your commands just for foolishness because we just say foolish things, dear Lord. Help us to have more love and respect for your name. God, I pray that you please help us to, to just increase our wisdom and our understanding and not to get caught up uh, with all these weird fables and um, just tossed about with every wind of doctrine, but that you just help us to be able to understand um, your words and to have good doctrine, good clear doctrine, dear Lord. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.